humility that we have in our lives to make a difference in people's lives. And that's what we're going to be looking at today as we, as we come into Colossians uh, chapter 4. And as we consider the fact that God has made us victorious, you know, our focus today really is about we have a Savior, and He is our whole focus, Jesus only, really, being what we look at. Because Jesus is our, our creator, he's our sustainer. Jesus is the one who looks after us, even after we fall and offend him and sin. He's the one who draws us in, He is the one who saves us, He is the one who gives us his Holy Spirit. He is the one who has promised to return for us. God himself at work, that is Jesus. I want to ask you, if all these things are true of Jesus, what else matters in life, in this world, anywhere? And yet it's so easy to be distracted, isn't it? To just focus on the things in life that drive us crazy. To focus on the things that are good. And only to see them. Or maybe sometimes we forget about Jesus because things are going really well. For instance, the Oilers win the Battle of Alberta, and that's all you can see. I find it overwhelming to think about the fact that we have a Savior in heaven who is interested our lives, who even has time just to look at us, to pay attention to us, is invested in where we're going. The love of God is something remarkable. I said a few weeks ago in the sermon that, that, that the Greeks had to invent a new word for love, or the, the early Christians did in the Greek language, because the words they had for love just didn't fully explain God's overwhelming love to us. It is real in my own life. And isn't the fact that the Savior is so invested in me, the Savior loves me this much, shouldn't that be what I am known for in this world? Well, if I mention the big hockey series this week, if I, if I see some of the names go along with that, what do you think about? If I say that just the name of David, what do you think about? Or Jim Hopkins, or go to the other side, Milan Lucic, what do you think? You may not be a hockey fan, but at least the names are familiar, right? We, we get certain images that come out in our minds, certain words that might be associated with that. Let me ask you, what do you think of? It's associated with your name. If I was to say your name and your family, amongst your friends, amongst your co-workers, what are the things that are going to come out, the things that people question? Are they just going to come up with your profession, or are they going to come up with uh, what you do, or are they going to describe someone who loves Savior, someone who is overwhelmed by the glory of God. Now, I don't want to, I'm not talking about being a, a fake person who talks about Jesus and the difference he makes and yet lives a life that is defeated and self centered. And so their lives don't match their words. I'm talking about somebody who lives every moment knowing that God is everything. That God is authentic, that he is loving, patient, gentle, under control, that he is full of hope. And so we become people who, who speak and, and treat the world as ones who have a victorious Savior. In such a way that, that even in the moments we're not necessarily witnessing our speaking the gospel, but 
but all through our lives, in all the things we say, and all the things we do, and just the way that we present ourselves in the world, it is evident that this is somebody who knows God is in charge, who lives with the confidence knowing that the Savior loves them desperately, that the Holy Spirit is at work in their lives. That no matter what life throws at us, no matter what occurs around us, I live in the confidence of a Savior. So we come to Colossians chapter 4. We're getting, uh, as we slowly work through this sermon series, we're, we're getting towards the end, which in verse 5, Apostle Paul says this, Walk in wisdom towards outsiders, making the best use of time. Now, if you were with us last week, came to a bit of a transition, and if you weren't, you can, you can catch up with the, the sermons online. Uh, I'm not sure if I said something really controversial or something last week, but usually on our online services, um, since we've gotten back to everybody being allowed in the sanctuary, and the, uh, we've been having about 10 people watch a week online, this last week I had 102 not entirely sure what that was all about. Uh, so obviously everybody watched my sermon last week multiple times. Um, it does tell me how long people watch for. A lot of them were like one minute or two minutes or something. But anyways, it's beside the point. You can catch up with old sermons online. It was kind of a transition point because he'd been talking, the Apostle Paul, been talking about family life and he uses prayer then as a transition from talking about our homes and our family to talking about victory. That he's not defeated despite the circumstances of life. And the Apostle Paul, he knows what he's talking about. He's writing from jail. He's in prison. Things are very much not going right. Everything's going wrong. And yet he can write and call the people towards victory. So we called last week, live like a convict. I called this week, act like, don't worry about the, the verbs there, act like. It's, it's pointing out the fact that there is somebody who can be in the worst possible scenario of life and still, despite the circumstances, live in victory. The world, when life, act a certain way, it is easy to react in anger and bitterness. The Apostle Paul, who knows everything about being under attack, calls on us to walk in wisdom. This idea of wisdom, it's, it's, it's related to this idea of, of living within reality, of really seeing the world for what it is. And what is our world? It is a world in which we have a victorious Savior. We're to bring Christ to a world that is in trouble, even though it doesn't know it is in trouble. We are to bring hope to a hopeless world. That's how we treat the world. Jesus comes along and he says something quite remarkable when he calls on us to love our enemies. Boy, that's hard. Because to love somebody who's treating you who thinks that we're the enemy is to act very different than how they're going to act. In their day and age, the world hated the church because they weren't following the local deities. They weren't acting like everybody else out there. And that was going to offend the deity. That was going to get them in trouble, they thought. For us, in this day and age, times are different, but we don't follow their ideologies. We don't follow the way in which they look at this world. In both cases, the world might look at us and say that, hey, you're doing something different than what we like, and therefore you're 
we start to be heroes, right? And yet we are to love. How do we do that? It's interesting, the Apostle Paul doesn't come along and say, okay, if people of this world treat you this way, I want you to act A, B, C, and D. And if they do this, I want you to do these things over here. He just tells us, I want you to walk in wisdom. Walk in wisdom. Now wisdom, we get wisdom by asking God. In fact, we're, we're told in the Bible that we can ask for wisdom and and our generous God will, will give it to us. But it's also really understanding who we worship. That our God is one who is in control. We need to be focused on God. Focused on Him all the time. It is so easy to be focused on the hurts of this world. It is so easy to be focused on the background noise that the world throws out there. It is so easy to be focused on words that are spoken in our midst. And then react to them. It's usually that's what gets us in trouble, isn't it? I'm not so much focused on God. I'm focused on what that person said. Focused on the struggles of I'm focused on my spouse said something or I'm focused on if my kids were misbehaving today. I'm focused on here or there or the next thing. And the call of God in our lives is those things matter, but they're not my focus. My focus is if I have a God who is victorious. I have a God who has done something remarkable. I need to be focused on the eternal. And the remarkable thing is the more focused we are on the eternal, the more effective we are as Christians in this world. The more we're focused on the things that are beyond this world, the more we can make a difference here. I need to know each and every moment that I live in the kingdom of God. That is the domain I live in. I have a king. Satan has lost me because I follow Jesus. But boy, he would love me to be focused on his realm. He would love me to keep my eyes on what's Disruptions he is bringing. But I have a new king. I live within a new kingdom. And that's what matters. We have a world. We have a world that is panicking. We have a world that is stressed. We have a world that is so easily offended. That so wants to just look at the things that go wrong. But you know what the reality is? And this is where wisdom comes in and looking at reality. My king has won the victory. My king rose from the dead. My king forgives sin. And you know what? The world needs to see people who are living with that reality. With that as what's all important. The world needs to see this. It's critical. We can easily miss a little bit of a, a wordplay that happens in this verse. In fact, we will because it just doesn't translate well into English. And so some of the some of the translations try to pick it up a little bit. Some don't even bother. The one I've got behind me doesn't. The very end of this, it says, making the best use of time. And it's almost like it's trying to give us an illustration. Imagine for a moment, you're living back in the ancient days. And you're putting on a special dinner. 
We have people coming over, I don't know what it is, maybe there's a wedding going on or, or, or something really special and you, you want things to be perfect and maybe you don't have quite enough money to make it all perfect, but you got a little bit of time. And so you go down to the marketplace and you start doing some very choosy shopping. You go around and you inspect everything. You look at, you smell all the spices in the market. You squeeze all the tomatoes. You look at all the meats, and you make some choosy, picky choices. I might not have enough money to get the, the best of this, so I'll, I'll trade it off and, and get something not bad for the spices to get a higher quality of meat. I, I, I go around and I, I make sure that I get the absolute best vegetable that I can get. I am picky as I shop. I am choosy about everything. When Paul says, make the best use of your time, he is saying you be choosy. Specifically about your time. Be choosy about what you spend your time your efforts. Why you put this in is I think it fits the context, particularly where we're going to go with the next verse. Be choosy about your reputation. Be picky about how you're seen. You put this back into the context of Colossians. He's just finished talking about that we are to declare the mystery of Christ. And we, we saw that way back in chapter 1, he defined the mystery of Christ as this, the hope of glory. Be choosy with your actions, your life. Be choosy with everything so that the hope of glory is declared in your life. May, may something very exciting come out of who you are. May you make this known. Now, in the book of Ephesians, the book of Ephesians is kind of a sister book to Colossians. It was written at about the same time. Paul probably sent the two of them off together, Colossians and Ephesians. They're, they're neighbors, so he probably sent both letters off. And he was kind of thinking the same things, a lot of the same themes. And in chapter 5, we get a very similar idea where he starts off talking a little bit different. He says, I want you to be awake. I want you to be alert in this world. Stay focused. Then he says, look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of time. So that sounds pretty similar. And then he throws in a dangerous word because in Ephesians, he gives the reason why this is important. Because. What that because is, do you know why we need to walk in wisdom? Okay. Why we need to invest our lives, our time, be choosy with them? Because the days are evil. In other words, living godly is not going to be simple. It's going to be hard. We do have a world that opposes us. What Paul is really trying to stress is in these days in which the world acts and speaks a certain way, boy, is it going to be critical that you're not one of them. That you are different. That you're not one of these panicked, stressed out ones who just reacts to everything that gets said but that you're wise in this world. Paul is saying the church needs to be people who are wise, who are focused on this victorious God. Do things so that you're focused on Christ, that he is the center of all. And it goes well with the idea that he's going to come up in verse 6 here. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each 
person. Salty. I don't know, as I said before, my doctor really doesn't want too much salt. Ah, so I don't know, Paul is trying to amaze my doctor's orders. But anyways. Salt can mean many things. I mean, certainly in these days, sometimes salty talk could be almost, you know, a lot of four letter words and things like that. Obviously, that's not what Paul means. I read one uh, book this week that said, well, it means that you should almost be entertaining and witty as you speak. Ah, maybe, but yeah, I don't think that's really what Paul was after. It's tied here to grace. Let your speech always be gracious. Gracious comes from grace. It's really hard. A little bit of a, a class right now, kind of brushing up on some counseling skills. I was talking that we almost need in life to have a traffic light in front of us all the time. That there's moments of time where we want to open our mouth and we need a red light to go. Sure. Sometimes the green light's good, we're good to go. Sometimes we need that yellow light, which can be a very important time in which we can accomplish things in talking to one another. But boy, we better be careful. Because you know how we often will fall into speech is sarcasm, calling names. Sometimes something real quick to kind of get that one last point. And you know how it always is? In our heads, what we're saying sounds smart. It sounds witty. It sounds good. It sounds logical. And how does everybody else in the world interpret? Sarcastic? Hostile? Aggressive? Mean? It's remarkable how words that come out of our mouth sound different to us than they do to anyone else. Particularly in those moments where emotions take over. Sounds good in my head, but boy, it hurts. Boy, it's actually Jesus has done all this in my life. Shouldn't I be overwhelmed with that goodness? Let that be reflected in the way I speak to people. Now, I'm not saying that what we need to do is push down our emotions. You know, that we sometimes hear that that's a dangerous thing to do, right? Ignore our emotions, just push them down. I'm going to tell you what needs to change is that emotional base. Our attitude needs to be reformed by Jesus. We need to let the Holy Spirit continue to go deeper and deeper into who we are, to penetrate deeper into the basis of who I am, so that I'm different. So that my life is real. That the words that come out of my mouth come out of the fact that the Holy Spirit has changed me immensely. The more I sit listening to a holy God, the less I am driven and pushed by my emotions only, and more and more that the fruit of the Spirit. Things we find in Galatians, wow, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness. All those things, the more that they are the base of who I am. I need to be anchored to a Savior always that changes who I am. To find the all-powerful 
all-knowing king and rest in his control. Now, throughout all of this, he's particularly looking at the, the first verse and talking about outsiders, particularly thinking about how we appear to the world as a whole. And I think here it's related to this, but it, it plays a role in all of life. How I speak, how I act, needs to be reflecting Jesus world attacks. But beyond that, you know where this is hardest? It's of course in our homes, isn't it? In marriage. With family. With those who are closest to you. It is so easy to just let spell out of our mouth that make relationship hard. To make it difficult to continue living with somebody else. And the call on us is not to be focused on the hurts, to focused on the things that it struggle, but to be so overwhelmed by the things of Jesus that you want to bring them deeper into the things of Jesus. You want them to know the love of God. That that is going to influence everything that I say, everything that comes out of my mouth. This is tough. Do you really know how you ought to answer each person? I mean, Paul doesn't tell us, hey, there's going to be a certain group of people driving nuts in this situation. I want you to do this in that moment. It goes back to the verse before where he says, I want you to walk in wisdom. I want you to be somebody who asks God how I should live. I want you to be somebody who is so focused on God, that's what you see. You see the world through that lens. That is so important to know that Jesus is working. It's so easy to make everything else about focus, isn't it? I mean, this last couple of years, it's been so easy to make COVID the focus of everything. I've already admitted that the last two weeks have been really easy to make the battle of Alberta. That's not a bad one to focus on. <laughs> but it can't be a bad one. It can't be a focus because Jesus is the focus of all of you. All of those things play a role in our lives. They don't go away. But they're not the driving force. It's Jesus at work is. That my speech needs to reflect every moment that the Holy Spirit is at work in my life, that I'm dealing with sin in my life, that everybody can see that the King is my King. And that's what matters. In a few moments, we're going to come to communion. Now, really, that's our heart. We do communion once a month. And the scriptures exactly how often you're supposed to do it. Early church probably did it every week. And to be honest, Protestant church started moving it to less often because they didn't want to be sick as well. It doesn't work right now. But it is my heart. The fact that my God would come to this world to die for me. The fact that I have a Savior would be willing to see his body broken. His blood spilled. That is everything. So we're going to take a moment to reflect. And I know many times I have sat in these places and somebody said, let's prayerfully reflect. And i got to be honest with you. My mind starts to wander. I don't know what happens to anybody else.
Sunday especially that I'm, I'm not going to run back and, and greet everybody. Um, but if you want to pray for any number of reasons, you are welcome to. To continue reflecting, that was a quick version of that. If I know the Spirit to lead us, revealing sin, asking the Spirit to help us reflect the glory of God, that was quick. If you need to spend more time doing that, that's great. If you want to come for prayer for healing or for anything else going on in your life, you're welcome to. If you want to just be quiet here, well, I'm encouraging people uh, sometime around their birthday to come see me, and I want to pray for people, specifically bless them around that time. I think it's important that the church actually blesses people. Um, so we invite you to stay and pray after we're done. We've got a few more things. not just a matter of us reading this and saying, okay, from now on, I'm just going to, my speech will be perfect. I don't want that. It needs to be in consideration of selling out to Jesus and continuing sitting at his feet. I'm going to come down, we're going to move towards communion, and we're going to read that are the familiar words out of Luke 22. And I did hide my Bible. 